stats these days. And so this is just to talk briefly about some of the work I, I do, which started as a hobby, but uh, kind of expanded over time. <coughs> so I spend probably approximately half of my time on the health side of things and half an atmosphere these days. Um, I, I also want to show a little bit about, about heat waves. I haven't worked on heat waves much myself, but Hannah and also Rachel Lowe are uh, co-authoring a, a book chapter on S2S health applications at the moment. So I wanted to show a little bit of their material as well on heat waves, but uh, forgive me if I'm, I'm not that uh, up to speed on that particular subject. Okay. So I thought I would start with uh, just focusing our minds on uh, the definition of early warning systems. This is a slide from the World Health Organization in 2008 where they were really outlining that we are designed to uh, set up systems that basically uh, give prior warning of events. Now, this seems really obvious for us because we're all working in meteorology and atmosphere and so on, and we're used to forecasting. But in the health side of things, in fact, for most, uh, should we say, health uh, implications, most, uh, most health outcomes, uh, very much the, the status of how people work is in terms of just surveillance and reaction. So in, in many diseases and many health outcomes, the whole mindset and paradigm of actually predicting an event in advance and moving your resources into place in advance is actually quite new. And you'll find that when you speak to many health workers and so on, that it's, it's, it's a very new concept for them. So what I'm going to talk about is a little bit uh, of, a, a, again, why we might want to use S2S, sub-seasonal, seasonal, uh, should we say, systems. We had a very nice introduction from Charles. Uh, and I want to just briefly go through two case studies uh, on heat waves and malaria. So I'm on quarter to nine. I have to keep an eye on the uh, time because I have a few slides on both of those. Okay. Uh, so Charles also very nicely introduced. I left this in for completeness about the different time scales and, uh, uh, should we say, lead times of the subseasonal. So I can skip safely over that. Uh, you already know now what S2S systems actually address. But I thought it might be uh, helpful just to leave this graphical overview of where the S2S uh, system fits in to the kind of forecasting pie uh, using ECMWF as an example. Again, it's the system I'm most familiar with. So, of course, they have their uh, high-resolution deterministic runs originally. Uh, then they were supplemented at one point by the ensemble runs, which went out to 15 days, uh, had many members, so you could assess the uncertainty of the forecast. And then as Franco introduced earlier on in the school, these were supplemented uh, after the late 90s by basically a, a seasonal system that predicted each month out to seven months and four times a year was extended to 13 months. And then in the late 2000s, Frederick Vittar set up uh, basically, the, the, basically the monthly system that basically sat in the middle of these, these two. It filled that gap between those two. So it ran out at that time to 32 days, and it was running once per week every Thursday, so you could uh, plan your weekend barbecue and so on. It fitted nicely at that time. Uh, so that was an intermediate resolution between the, the EPS and high resolution and the seasonal. In the meantime, that's essentially been integrated into the ensemble prediction system. So like the seasonal system is extended out to 13 uh, months. We saw from Charles's table that the uh, S2S system is actually an extension of the EPS out to 40 days, 48 days, running basically twice a week now, every Monday and Thursday. Okay. Uh, just to, on that table, on Charles's table, you, there, there was a, a mentioning of the, the hindcast, uh, just to emphasize that one of the key differences between these is that the hindcast period of running for the same date for the previous 20 years in order to be able to calibrate the model is done what, how we say on the fly. So every time you make a forecast, there's a set of hindcasts, whereas the seasonal system at the moment is using a, a fixed hindcast period. And I don't remember from the System 5 talk you gave whether that's still going to be the case for System 5. It's still on the fixed period. It's still the, still the fixed period. So just to emphasize that, if you, these are your operational now forecast in red, you have a set of hindcasts that basically move with the system, okay? And that's good. If the model's being updated frequently, you need to do that, uh, the model version. Whereas the system four and system five uh, models 
tend to be fixed at a certain model version for a longer period of time and then can use a fixed hindcast, period, hindcast uh, forecast speed, hindcast speed uh, which of course is cheaper because you only run it once. That's the main reason why these are fixed. Okay. Not all systems do that. Uh, I'm going to skip over this very quickly, but for example, the Met Office system has lagged starts and they actually uh, run the hindcast suite uh, for both the seasonal and the, the, the S2S system. Okay, just to emphasize the difference. So why might you use S2S? Well, uh, to give you an example, <clears throat> this is just for the operational forecast in 2012, looking at all the hindcast suite, and it's an extremely simple statistic. I'm just taking the uh, correlation of the week one to four temperatures of the ensemble mean. So there's no probabilistic verification here. And it's just looking for the whole of 2012, what the mean over that, that year of the, the skill is in the S2S system. And on the right-hand side, it's the gain in that correlation compared to the same days in the seasonal forecast. And this is for the first Thursday of each month. Okay. So why would you get a, a gain in skill compared to the seasonal system? Well, there are three key reasons. One is the lead time advantage. Uh, even though I'm picking the first Thursday, then it's, uh, it's not going to be the first of the month. And the seasonal forecast starts at the first of the month. So you have a lead time advantage. So that's one of the reasons why, and the key reason why you'd want to use S2S in health applications. You simply have more frequent updates through the month. So you can slot those in at the start of your, should we say, climate information. But also recall that the ECMWF sub-seasonal uh, system it's been updated with each new operational version. So once, twice, three times a year, there's a new forecast system with new physics upgrades and so on that are incorporated into the monthly system, which you have to wait a little longer to actually have those uh, benefits in the seasonal system. And also the framework. So for example, the S2S, as I just pointed out, is a high resolution system. So you might have some advantages there. So at the moment, I'm trying to split those three effects up. I wanted to show this because I, I find variations of this plot are often shown when people talk about S2S. This is from uh, my colleagues at IRI. And I do think, actually, it's a little bit misleading. So you often see this kind of plot where you say, well, this is the, the weather forecast range. This is like lead time. Here the seasonal. And this is the S2S. And then this is some kind of schematic of skill. And you often see this kind of plot where you say, well, OK, the sub-seasonal. And then they point out that uh, you have uh, for example, Madden Julian oscillation giving you predictability on these kinds of time scales and so on. And it's, you see this kind of jump. And I, I feel this is a little bit misleading. That's why I wanted to point this out, in that you would only expect to have an advantage over the short range, for example, high resolution system if there were an aspect of physics that was represented in this system that was particularly tuned or added to represent these effects. So to give you an example, the seasonal forecast system, you might expect that to have a, uh, an advantage over the deterministic if this were to run out to two months because it's coupled to the ocean and the very short range deterministic, if I'm not wrong and it hasn't changed in the last couple of years, is still basically having fixed SSTs. Okay, so you are modeling a process that's evolving in time over these timescales that's not in this system. On this uh, system here, for example, yes, the Madden Julian oscillation might give you predictability in the tropics at a two month time scale, but it is not that this has a convection scheme that's tuned to improve the Madden Julian representation in this system and not in this. They use the same convection scheme setup. So this system here should represent the Madden Julian oscillation equally, or if not better, because of the higher resolution. So I just wanted to emphasize that uh, you have to take these schematics with a little bit of a pinch of salt. Uh, there's several variations of these. Anyway, uh, that's my introduction. Uh, now I want to talk about health outcomes, applications in health. This list could go on forever. Uh, health, uh, of course, is impacted. Uh, climate impacts health through nutrition, heat waves, weather extremes, uh, uh, menococcal meningitis. Uh, uh, there's a, a group working uh, on the Merit Project in Dijon. Uh, cholera, vector-borne diseases, there's a whole long list here. There's not even room to fit them on the, the slide. I'm just going to introduce two examples of heat waves and uh, malaria. 
and to point out that although we're talking about S2S, so two weeks to basically eight weeks lead times in terms of the meteorology, when it comes to the health application, that lead time will vary tremendously depending on what kind of application. So, for example, for something like heat waves or weather extremes, that effect, that impact is almost immediate. Okay. Whereas if we talk about vector-borne disease, we'll see that there's a kind of a spin-up time for the system. So you're actually uh, a two-month weather forecast uh, will actually perhaps give you information out to four months due to the inherent lag in the system. So the health application, uh, should we say advanced warning, really will depend. And how that fits into the decision process really will depend on the disease. So there's a study, for example, in Rift Valley Fever that shows that even a three-month accurate forecast wouldn't be that much use uh, because the main intervention in terms of vaccination uh, needs longer advanced warning. There are not the stocks. It's a short shelf life. Access to the field in the rainy season is difficult and so on. So how is climate actually used in, in, should we say, health applications? Well, so far, in terms of forecasting, as I mentioned, not that often. It's often used, for example, in uh, mapping. So if we take malaria, again, as an example, uh, this map on the right is indicating countries that, in the green or red, incorporate malaria in terms of a mean risk map within their country. So they know, for example, where malaria incidents might be high or low, using climate to try and basically uh, help them in that assessment when they may not have necessarily good local district uh, data. Okay. So that was by a paper by Amumbo. In terms of actually forecasting, well, there are several approaches, and I'm going to go through a couple of examples, as I said. It's very rare to see these operationalized. So most of these examples you'll find are essentially pilot or demonstration projects, uh, as will be the, the two examples I show today, where climate can be either used directly, as in the case of heat waves, or it might be used to drive simple uh, statistical models or simple indices, uh, derive simple indices of health outcomes, or perhaps to drive more complex uh, dynamical models. Um, and I want to emphasize at the end of the talk that mapping this model outcome into a decision entry point is is extremely challenging. Okay, so the first case study will be on heat waves, uh, which uh, at the moment you see are very, very topical, but of course, uh, I mean, they've always been around. Uh, there's a lot of talk now about actually trying to attribute uh, heat wave probabilities uh, to, for example, the global warming. There's a lot of uh, good work going down in Exeter and, uh, and, and so on, actually trying to attribute uh, global warming uh, percentages to heat waves. But um, we're, we're concentrated on S2S timescales. So first of all, uh, heat stress is more than just temperature. So there are a lot of factors at play. Uh, clothing is your exposure. Uh, there's the humidity and so on. And so people have actually built uh, complex models to actually uh, try and uh, represent this. So there is a model that was derived and is sometimes used in Germany that tries to account for air temperature, radiation, humidity, and wind. They actually have a clothing model, an exposure model, and they try and work out, uh, for example, for different occupations, if you're a, a, a traffic policeman standing outside in the street compared to somebody working in a factory and so on, what the differences may be in uh, the actual heat stress in different occupations and exposure <coughs> locations. But of course, these kind of models need a lot of uh, small-scale information. To do a general in index with this kind of complexity is extremely uh, difficult. So usually, heat wave prediction relies on very simple indices. Now, there's a bewildering array, array of these indices. You'll find some of them are just based on temperatures. I don't expect you to read the table. This is just one example. There's a whole host of these uh, type of papers in the literature that intercompare 4 or 10 or 50. There was even one I saw. I couldn't find it yesterday again. I, I wish I'd noted it down. It's really annoying. There was 27 variations of heat indices. And often they'll intercompare them, uh, trying to evaluate them, for example, with uh, mortality data for a particular location. Usually they come to the conclusion that uh, a modification of one of the indices is actually the best, and so they add a new one to the pile. Uh, so... 
I'm going to go through some of the aspects of these, but they're normally based on some combination of humidity, temperature, that's integrated in time. So I'll explain that now. So a lot of them basically are some kind of variation on a kind of feels like temperature. They will take a temperature and a relative humidity, maybe incorporate wind, and try to actually uh, derive a basically a, a feels like uh, exposure indices. Now, the actual details change uh, in terms of the time that this index is maybe integrated before and a warning is actually uh, emitted. The other problem is, <coughs> even if you drive one of these, it's often very, uh, it's, it is very location specific. So if you actually look <coughs> at the statistical association between mortality and temperature in somewhere like London, you'll find that the mortality starts to basically curve upwards once you go above uh, essentially this line here is the, up, the I think this was the upper 10 uh, percentile or the 5 percentile around 22 degrees which incidentally <coughs> so it happens also to be the, the maximum temperature that my mother can actually endure before she starts continually complaining so I think this graph is exactly correct um, on the other hand if you go to somewhere like Taiwan or Trieste this threshold where basically mortality starts to kick upwards is in the in the low 30s and so uh, again that would be probably similar somewhere in this climate here so there's a lot of uh, adaptation and also filtering and again this shows the same thing in Bangladesh okay in addition to this there's also short-term acclimatization so let's show you here so for example in Germany's uh, heat system they actually uh, use uh, a, a running mean looking at the anomaly compared to the last 30 days. And this is to account for short-term acclimatization. A sudden heat wave right at the beginning of the year, uh, uh, our bodies are not actually used to it. There. We haven't uh, undergone acclimatization. It's actually more dangerous than towards the end of the sister, uh, season. So this is showing how the thresholds for the extreme strong, moderate, and slight uh, heat wave uh, actually evolve over the, uh, the year, going through the year, going from January through to the following January. And that's to account for local climatization. So you can compare, for example, to climatolo climatology in that particular month, or you can use this running mean. Okay. The other aspect that's often tweaked in all of these different indices is the accumulation. So it's, we're a little bit like plants in this respect. If you have, for example, groundnuts can withstand 35 degrees for a day or two, but if you have it for five days, then they're in trouble, especially if it's the flowering season. So we're a little bit like ground nuts in some respect, that if you have an integration of a high temperature over time, then there's a much larger impact. So you can see here that uh, this is actually mortality data uh, compared to T max, and you can see that this event here is not actually hotter than earlier events, okay? But the duration is much longer. And that uh, actually then means that, um, sadly, there's a, there's a much larger impact uh, of that. So a lot of the tweaking of these indices comes down also to the temporal integration of the exceedance of a threshold. Okay. So again, for completeness, I left uh, this table in there. And it's showing uh, a number of countries uh, going all the way through from Belgium right through to USA at the bottom here. Uh, uh, and it's showing that they mostly use simple indices uh, based on, uh, most of them just on temperature. Uh, some use uh, other variables uh, which are highlighted here, such as humidity and wind speed and so on, to actually incorporate that into that feels like temperature. And uh, most places actually have some kind of aspect of the duration. But you can see that there's... Uh, a different indice, index in nearly every country in terms of this exceedance. Okay. So an example heat wave system from France uh, is using the, the three-day running average of minimum and maximum temperatures for each region. Or oh, There's a, a seven-day warning that's been set up by, by Georgia Tech in, in India. Okay. But nearly all of these uh, indices are at short range, uh, should we say, time scales. Uh, they're, they're basically using uh, the deterministic forecasts, and this is one example where it actually gets out to seven days. Nearly all of them are just for the next two, three, four days using short-range forecasts. So there's been a recent example. This is the only uh, example that's actually specifically using the S2S so far, which was looking 
at the prediction of the 2003 extreme event in, in Europe, uh, uh, which I think was the only time when I was living in the UK, I actually had to sleep in my garden during that, that event. It's, that's how it, it, was, uh, it, was, it was that hot, uh, in, incredibly. So these days I'm kind of used to that temperature now. But it, it was, I think in Reading, we got up to about 34, 34 and a half, which was, if I remember rightly, it was around 34 uh, uh, at the time. And so Rachel and her collaborators were actually looking at using the S2S uh, forecast from ECMWF uh, to see if they could extend that, uh, should we say, warning uh, of the, uh, the event in August uh, out to longer lead times. And so they found that uh, basically using the, the single daily S2S uh, values, they, they had... Uh, an indication of the event out to about uh, day 10. But they concluded that uh, when you get to day 15 and day 18, that essentially that particular event, it's just a single event, uh, was not any predictable. That's the only uh, example so far in the literature of actually using these S2S systems. And it's just a single event, and it's using the S2S system just on a daily time step. So what we've got to start thinking about is how to basically adapt the way we use these, uh, should we say, uh, systems uh, integrated over longer time steps in a kind of, should we say, dovetailed manner, where we're not just simply trying to extend the use of the forecast as we would a deterministic uh, system, and how that fits into the decision process. Because if you actually look, this was an example from the Red Cross of their own heat health decision-making uh, process across timescales. The IRI are very fond of this ready, set, go way of considering the use of short-range S2S and seasonal forecasts. And if you look at the actual decisions that these forecasts would tie into, then you'll find that the short-range, this is in place in many of these countries. So this part of the ready, set, go is already operationalized in terms of using short-range forecasts to uh, predict these indices and set warnings. Uh, prepare for increase, for example, power demand due to increasing cooling demands and so on. But when you look at the decisions that are made uh, over longer timescales, they don't fit clearly into the, uh, the way that we're using these uh, daily output from the S2S systems. I wanted to quickly run through uh, another case study, which uh, I'm a little bit more familiar with on the malaria side of things. Uh, early warning in malaria actually goes back a surprising uh, way. Uh, uh, after the uh, epidemic in 1908, there was a lot of interest in India to actually try and set up prediction systems. And so there was actually a simple statistical model that was uh, published by Gill. It's not Adrian Gill, it's a different Gill, uh, um, uh, in, the, in the 1920s, uh, which incorporated climate uh, into this simple index. And it was actually used operationally. So India had operational predictions of malaria for the season ahead uh, right through the 1920s to the 1940s. And then, basically, the whole interest in early warning and health in, in malaria just waned through the 50s and 60s because suddenly the world switched to elimination. Uh, that was all based on the fact that we had DDT. So in the 20s to 40s, control was much more in terms of water management, drainage schemes, draining swamps, and, and, and so on. So it was really control of breeding efforts, uh, screening on uh, huts and houses, of course, where that could be uh, afforded. Based um, um, on the, the knowledge of the vector system. Malaria basically rebounded when the elimination efforts uh, petered out in the, in the 1960s, uh, and then Research interest accelerated, particularly after the ENSO-related outbreaks in the Highlands in 98-99. So the last 15, 20 years have seen a lot of interest in early warning systems in malaria. How does the uh, climate actually impact malaria? So I just included this cartoon to quickly show you. The, the, the basic uh, life cycle of the, the vector is the, the, the female emerges from the pupa. She needs a blood mill to get uh, basically protein to develop her eggs. She lays the eggs and they develop, uh, new adults emerge and so on. So basically the 
development time of the larvae is dependent on water temperature. The egg development in the female is also dependent on temperature. If it gets too hot, the mortality rate increases of both the adult and the, the, uh, the, the, the larvae stage. When she takes the blood meal, if she's basically biting someone who's infected with the parasite, she can acquire that parasite. It then undergoes a life cycle in the vector before she can pass it on to somebody else. And that life cycle, that incubation period, uh, it's basically the sporogonic cycle it's known as, is also highly temperature dependent. So the warmer it is, the faster these cycles spin, but if it gets too warm, the mortality of the vector increases. Okay, so you get a, a sweet spot, so to speak, in transmission. Just to give an example, this is that sporogonic cycle length as a function of temperature, so you can see it's dropping as the system gets faster, but the mortality rate also increases, so the survivability drops off as a function of temperature. Just including and putting those two effects together, you get this kind of, uh, should we say, behavior where your maximum probability of a vector acquiring the parasite and passing it on peaks at the low 30s. The exact nature of that curve really depends on the, uh, should we say, the details, particularly of the larvae cycle. This is just two effects. So you can see that, as well as rainfall, which provides the breeding sites for the vector, that if you're somewhere here on the curve, perturbations in temperature can spin up this cycle and increase the intensity of the transmission or actually reduce it. So temperature and precipitation are going to be the two key variables that we want to predict. And this is just to show how uh, this is the, the rainfall and this is malaria transmission. And you can see that there's a lag of one to two months. And that lag length will also depend on temperature as well. Okay. So if you just monitor rainfall and the intensity of rainfall, if you assume that rainfall relates to breeding sites and it's not a linear relationship, you might have some chance of predicting the intensity of the season just by monitoring rainfall. Adding S to S systems in there, you hope having the predictability and the skill, if you have it out to week three, week four, that you might add another month to the lead time available, which was shown in this uh, cartoon by Da Silva and colleagues at uh, IRI, uh, again, basically back in 2004, that's saying if you surveil, have case surveillance, you only know about an outbreak in a highland area after it's occurred. If you can actually monitor rainfall, you have uh, some one to two months possible lead time. And then seasonal climate forecasts in that context could actually extend that lead time. Um, the, the relationship is very nonlinear due to flashing, but I'm going to basically skip over those. Uh, again, I talked about decision entry points, uh, how we actually fight malaria. There's a whole host of basically, uh, should we say, uh, adaptation uh, and uh, sh short time scale interventions that one can actually apply. So, uh, for example, land management, uh, healthcare structure, and so on. That was the emphasis in the early part of the 20th century. Everything switched to basically DDT in the 50s and 60s. Uh, at the moment, the emphasis is on basically bed net distribution and indoor residual spraying. So this is something less invasive than spraying of uh, breeding sites and more effective. Okay. So these are basically decisions, particularly the indoor residual spraying, where you might want to adapt the timing of your spraying because this is normally only a season length that it lasts somewhere like the north of Ghana where the onset can change quite considerably from year to year. You might want to use that kind of information to actually guide uh, this. So, um, Let's skip over this. So early examples of early warning systems, well, one, uh, one of the canonical studies was actually in 2006 by Madeleine Thompson and, and colleagues also from ECMWF that were using, uh, and many others as well, using Demeter forecast to drive a simple statistical model uh, for all uh, country malaria in Botswana. Um, it's a, a very famous example. If you actually look at the paper, though, it only actually uses validation of malaria cases for two separate years. So it's massively cited. But the main message in that paper is that the rainfall was predictable in Botswana up to four months ahead. But the, the actual validation against the case data was, again, extremely limited. It's, 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 a, it's a highly cited paper. But it, it doesn't have a multi-year validation against uh, cases. The Liverpool model has also been used uh, to look at the potential predictability in Africa and India. Um, 
And anyone that's interested, I can show some of these results offline or over coffee. Um, and rainfall has also been used to drive simple compartmental models uh, which have been calibrated for certain areas, particularly, for example, there's a good example in India by Lanier et al. Uh, but those models allow no seasonality. So there are very few uh, examples of dynam uh, dynamical model systems that are actually evaluated against case data. So just to show you one very quick example of what we try to do with a, a dynamical model, uh, uh, evaluating it against uh, real case data over basically Uganda. So what we did was we set up the dynamical model, calibrated, using the S2S system for the first month at this time, because this is when the, the, uh, the lead times were actually shorter before it was extended to 48 days. Uh, and then we supplemented that by the, the system four for month two to four. And we were initializing the malaria forecast from a, should we say, an analysis of the malaria conditions, actually using the uh, interim, uh, the reanalysis to drive the vector model because you don't have real-time uh, observations of entomological conditions and so on. Let me skip over that to just show this. So this is basically the lead one to four skill. And this pie shot is just showing red where temperature is uh, basically skillful green malaria, and blue rainfall, and then you have these intersections. So you can see at one month lead time, we have quite a lot of areas. I'm only showing areas where ma malaria is epidemic, so it's not every year high transmission. It's the areas where there's a lot of variability from year to year. So it's all of the fringe highland areas, or the fringe areas, uh, like for example, for the monsoon onset, or along the Sahel. And you'll find that most of the areas are either white at lead one, which means temperature and rainfall contributing to the malaria uh, predictability, or they are yellow, which means that the rainfall uh, skill has actually dropped off, as we saw in, in the previous talk. But the temperature variability, remember that curve, uh, is still giving you some skill in the malaria. As we move to the right, the plots turn green, which means the malaria predictions are still skillful. This is against the, the reanalysis of the malaria, until it turns black. So the Use of the initialization and the S2S basically pushes us forward. Rather than having just a one-month lead time, we can get out to month two to three. And my VPN just dropped off. I don't know why that does that. Okay. So then what I want to quickly show in the last couple of minutes is then we've been, uh, we made a considerable effort to use both confirmed sentinel site data at six sites uh, in Uganda as well as district data to try and evaluate the system. Okay, so this is work that's still in progress that we're writing up now. And it's looking, and you'll see straight away, one of the problems is with the Sentinel site data, the data sets are very short. So we only have a span of about five or six years, depending on the site. And so what you'll find is, what we're looking at here is each point is the forecast that would have been available one, two, three, or four months ahead. So we found that the system, for example, this is Ginger, this is Kanungo. I'm not going to go through all of the sites, but the system is able to uh, basically predict the year-to-year, season-to-season uh, anomalies in the actual uh, transmission. Okay, so we're taking out the the annual cycle here, uh, but sometimes there's a, a should we say a, a, a shift. So we're looking at this this girl now. Um, the same for the district data. You'll find that often the district data, in some districts, it does a very good job. Then you can go to the district right next door, which pretty much is the same altitude, same climate, same rainfall, and you can get things like this, where there's just no correspondent whatsoever. So this is, again, highlighting the difficulties of using uh, health data sets. I used to worry uh, at ECMWF about biases of 5% in, in radius on humidity. And when you start to work with health data, you realize that they were really the, the good old days. Uh, compared to this. So you, you get very speckled maps when you look at skill uh, as a function of the, the district, uh, okay. as I said. So I'm going to skip over these because I'm running out. We have to try to do a simple economic assessment. I think I'm in my last minute, no? I'm, I'm out, yeah. So uh, basically, where well, we try and uh, turn it into a hit-miss, cost-loss uh, analysis. And so you, you get this kind of uh, plot, and we've done this for basically all of the different sites where this is our cost-loss rate of actually doing an inf uh, making a, uh, an intervention uh, compared to the loss uh, if you don't make that intervention. So up here, you don't have any economic best benefit because the cost of intervention is so high that the forecast needs to be very accurate to have an economic benefit. 
down here, the cost of intervention is so low, you would just simply always uh, intervene, and you wouldn't use the forecast. It has to be, again, extremely accurate. And so we, we've been working uh, to try and use these because we, we feel that this perhaps helps to, to map the, the forecast performance a little bit better onto a, a decision point, but it's still very difficult. How do you actually uh, assign these costs, especially when you're talking about a disease that has uh, implications of mortality? I mean, it's extremely difficult. Uh, you can put a bed net cost in or screening cost, loss of productivity. So people have tried to do these kind of assessments, economic assessments, but the error bars are extremely large. Okay. And of course, I'm going to finish almost here, that you've got this problem of when you have decisions, decisions are not made necessarily on a, a yes, no, black and white. We're very used to showing things like Bryce skill scores, and, and, and that's where we finish. But when it really comes to decisions, uh, you have lots of other factors that come into play. I mean, a famous example is if you give a warning. Uh, I remember the, uh, well, in, in Geneva, there was a flash flood warning. It wasn't given, and there was uh, a lot of uh, clamor against the, the local council in Geneva. And now, every time there's a cloud anywhere on the horizon, they give a flash flood warning because they don't want to get blamed. So, uh, but on the other hand, I remember down in Julianova one year, they gave a, a warning of very poor weather. And then the council got sued because lots of German tourists didn't turn up. They changed their, their holiday plans because they're coming by car, so they're very flexible last minute. And so all these kind of decisions, I, I don't know, I don't want to sound too flippant, but when you're trying to consider where your forecast entry point comes in, all of these aspects... Uh, have to be basically uh, taken into account. I don't have time to talk about the genetic algorithm uh, development. So I'm just going to finish uh, there. Uh, I'll probably just uh, leave this up. Uh, I've hinted at uh, some of these aspects, the difficulty in, in evaluating these early warning systems, uh, particularly, I think it's quite exciting now this time, particularly with the Copernicus moving towards open access to these seasonal forecasts. S2S gives us the ability to use this massive, brilliant data set of hindcast to actually test out our ideas. And then maybe possibly go to the Eastern WF Council and say, look what we can do in Uganda with this system. Uh, I think it's, uh, it's really amazing. We need to be able to use this information as well to, uh, should we say, uh, justify even resource allocation. Even in the malaria elimination phase, you can still use climate information and forecast to help you judge how your elimination is actually being uh, gauged. Um, I will just finish off there. Uh, we can talk about that afterwards. So a little bit of publicity. Some of the work that's been uh, shown here is uh, contributing to a new book on S2S, which should appear next year, Andy Robinson and Frederick at uh, ESMWF. And also, just to highlight, if you're interested in the S2S system and timescales, there are a couple of workshops coming up, one on S2S and teleconnections that Fred is also organizing. Uh, in October, and I think the application is still open until next month, yes? Uh, there's one in Rwanda, so if anybody is from that region here in East Africa, in Kigali, that Fred and I are also uh, running there, and it's possible it's not confirmed yet, uh, there may be one next year in Paraguay as well for our uh, South American colleagues in the room who might be interested in actually keeping an eye open for that. So uh, I'll stop there. Sorry, I've overrun slightly. <laughs>